The 2019 Australian Christian Book of the Year is The Fountain of Public Prosperity, Evangelical Christians in Australian History from 1740 to 1914 by Stuart Higgins and Robert Linda and published by Monash University Publishing. Stuart, would you like to come up and David Gronenbergen from Monash University Publishing, come and join me on the stage, please. Um, let me read what the judges had to say about the fountain of public prosperity. This gripping and impressively researched book puts evangelical Christianity at the centre of the Australian story from the 18th century through to World War I. It begins by recounting the friendship between a First Fleet officer, Lieutenant Dawes, and some of the indigenous Eora. It goes on to introduce female suffragettes and missionary workers, Chinese evangelists, evan evangelists and moral reformers, a wide range of people who imagine their community and its future through the eyes of faith. Professors Piggin and Linda have devoted decades to unearthing the story of Christ-like citizenship in Australia, and the result is a fluent work of national and international importance. Offering a radical revision of some of the received wisdom about our nation, it can be read from cover to cover, enjoyed in sections, and revisited as a reference. It is a landmark account of the enormous influence of evangelical Christians in shaping modern Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, the author of The Fountain of Public Prosperity, Stuart Piggin. Stuart, I was super, super, super excited when I realised that you'd won the award because I studied history. And so for me to sort of declare that a history book of 573 pages with four pages of primary sources, primary sources and a copious appendix and footnotes have won, uh, this award was a moment uh, to thrill in. Um, so I was really excited. Thank you so much for writing it. But I wanted to ask, I have to admit, it is a heavy book. Uh, it's probably not a book you necessarily want to take to bed with you on a cold Sunday evening. I'll take it to bed every minute, don't you? Oh, well, okay, there you go. I stand corrected. Um, uh, my non-historian friends... <laughs> you put it on top of your head and sort of let it drift into your head by osmosis. Um, uh, for someone who's not a historian, who's not trained, who needs to read this book? What did you write this book for? Well, the... The blame for 570 pages is Monash University Press <laughs> because they allowed me to uh, publish, have such an enormous book published, and that's only half the story. Yeah. Okay. Because there's a second volume to come. Oh, excellent. And this Monash is great. Monash is going to publish this just before Christmas. I'll take it both So you can to all bed. buy that for your, your relatives just before Christmas. But uh, uh, I, do, I do want to um, pay tribute to Monash because they've just been a delight to work with. Um, they're, so, they're so professional. Mm. the way they do things. I ne I've never had a moment of anxiety with them, and they've been so generous letting me do... I mean, uh, in the first contract I received, it said, you're allowed to have 215,000 words. And I said, I've already written 235,000. <laughs> and so Nathan Hollyer, who was then in charge of the mm. whole show, said, oh, just, just cross out 215,000, put 235,000. <laughs> so that was, that was the way it was done. <laughs> and then they allowed me to sell it for... $50, which mm. for a book like this is just incredible. It's just yeah. a giveaway. Uh, uh, I mean, normally an academic book like this would cost about $125 or something yep. like that. Mm. A generous donor has sort of subsidised it a bit, but it's been very uh, kind of Monash to take on this, this, this sort of unusual business plan in order to get this. I, I thought, I want to answer your question, I want Christians to read this sure. in, in churches, and uh, therefore I thought they're not going to pay $125 for a book. They might pay, pay $50 for a hardback or $40 for a paperback, yeah. uh, and so that's what, that's what we've done. Uh, I certainly hope that every evangelical minister in Australia will read it, because uh, we have, and perhaps many beyond it, of course, because mm. we, in, we in Australia have got our Australian history terribly wrong. And it needs to be revised in all sorts of areas. The, the thing that dawned on me, me progressively, it just sort of started at the end of the, at the, end of the uh, century, actually, when I was looking at a mine disaster in, in, in Mount Kembla in New South Wales. And I realised 
just how incredibly uh, religious these people were. And then I found out that just months before this mine disaster, there had been a genuine religious revival in Mount Kembla. And I thought, but I didn't think we... This was a long time ago, 30 mm. years ago. I thought, I didn't, I didn't know we had revivals in Australia. But since, I, I've, since then, I found them all over the place. And the book ends... I tell you this because not everybody gets to the end of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want you to get to the end of the book because okay. there's a very exciting bit at the end, I think, about <laughs> uh, an answer to this question. Did the Welsh Revival, possibly the most famous revival in the 20th century, did the Welsh Revival begin in Australia? I think it might have. See what you think of the argument at the end of the book. Uh, so I think that uh, it'd be good if... If, if, if Australians get their Australian history right, and if they did, they'd be, they'd be encouraged, because at the moment, uh, Christians are discouraged. Uh, they, we, we think we're failing. When the secularists tell us to keep off the turf, separation of church and state, we accept it. We, we all tend to believe in the separation of church and state. That's not been the Australian experience. The Australian experience is the interdependence of church and state. And when church and state cooperate together, good things happen. And there's no reason why they shouldn't happen. The church needs the state just as much as the state needs the church. Sexual abuse. So there's a lot of valuable lessons there, I think. I think I'm rabbiting on. <laughs> Thank you so much. You can carry on rabbiting. I don't mind. Um, yes. So 573 pages. Well worth it. Get to the end. One other comment. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you had one in you. <laughs> On, the, on this marvellous music we've had tonight, we've mm. heard about Nil and Druin and Robin Hood. Yeah. I mean, Jesus has been in all those places. You see, Jesus has been everywhere in Australia. Jesus is the great hero of Australia. He's been in every community. And what we should look for is what Jesus has done in every community. So the book is just full of little stories about what Jesus has done in the most remote, most, uh, uh, remote communities. I don't know if it mentions Druin, <laughs> but uh, it does... It does I'll mention the, the Lodden Valley. I came across this marvellous account of a revival in Lodden Valley. It was just handwritten. It had never been published. But this guy claims that every farmer and every farmer's wife and every kid who lived in that area, every one of them was converted. There was, he said, I do not know anybody in this district who has, not, who has not been converted. Now, this happens in Australia. This is the land of... This is secular Australia, the land of amiable pagans. No, no, this is, a, this, this is possibly one of the most Christianised countries in the world. And at the backbone of the book uh, it was a discovery that we, we made in the mid-80s when I asked a class to write the history of the churches of the... Take, I said, take a church in the Illawarra and write a history of it. So what we did was we made a list of all the churches that were in the Illawarra and we, found, we made this amazing discovery that four churches... Catholic, Anglican, Methodist, Presbyterian, were all built in every town about the same time, costing about the same amount of money. Nowra, Kayama, Jamboree, all costing about the same amount of, about, about of money. And then someone said, oh, our church is pretty poor, really. We'll pull it down and start again. So they pulled it down and they put up a nice stone Gothic thing. And then all the others followed suit. Now, what historians have said about this is that this is... Sectarianism. This explains why Christians are always arguing with each other. You've got all these different groups. We came up with a completely different interpretation of that. Of course, there is a, a genuine sectarian problem between Catholics and Protestants until Vatican II. But before that, um, historians don't tend to talk about... Uh, they, they love talking about conflict. But the churches, most of the time, are cooperating with each other and they're learning from each other. And what happened was you get, you get this genuine... Uh, uh, um, Holy emulation, we call it, rather than sectarian rivalry. They're all learning from each other. And what it meant was that you got a very Christianised society because you have all these ministers. In England, you have one church in the community. In Australia, you have four. And you have four ministers. And you're getting all these Christian values. Australia has become one of the most Christianised countries on earth as a result of this. And we should therefore appeal uh, to people to just to bring this up again because it's not deep... It's not too, mm. It's not buried too deep, even in the secular mind of Australians. Wonderful. Thank you so much.